I'm going to share some slides to begin with to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing tonight and to introduce uh, myself and Honey. So I'm Dr Hazel Harrison, I'm a clinical psychologist and we've also got with us today Honey Dinsley. And um, so this is me, this is me um, earlier this year, I was doing some filming with the BBC and they were able to put me into this very clever backdrop of a brain lab. And more recently, I did a little project with the BBC with Hacker the Dog. And so from that now, most people refer to me as Hacker does and in the same way that he does. So let me play you the clip so that you can also call me I, by the I, same thing. Talking of exercise, Cocker, let's pop over now to Dr. Hazel in the brain lab and find out how it helps us with our well-being. Dr. Hazel, tell us some more of your top-notch info, please. <laughs> I'm such a big fan of Hacker and I hope you are too. Um, so most people now, after that clip, refer to me as Dr. Azel. So you can say that too if you want to. And I'm also delighted to be joined tonight by Honey um, from the Art Hive. She's come up with some really creative ideas for us to get stuck into. So Honey, do you want to say hi? And I've been drawing and scribbling and making things out of Lego and creating and making things out of junk for as long as I can remember. And I love origami, but it can be a challenge, especially when you're a beginner. So don't lose heart. Just watch the sequence carefully. And at the end of it, you'll hopefully have a fantastic origami brain house for you to use and display in your house. talk to children about their brains and how their brains work one of the things I say is that our brains are a bit like a great big box of Lego in fact a box of Lego that's got something like 89 billion pieces in it so if you can imagine how big that box might be um, it would be really exciting to dig into that box wouldn't it and inside this box of Lego we've got different types of blocks maybe we've got a few pieces like in this picture here where there might be a door or a window and we can think about this box of lego as being a bit like how our brains work and when we're born some of the parts of our brain that we call neurons these special brain cells some of them already know what their job is going to be they are going to be the part of your brain that's going to help you to be to breathe or to see or um, to balance or to hear things. And then there are also loads of bits in our brain that actually haven't got a job yet. And they start to connect up and wire together um, when we do things and when we learn new things. And so when we think about how the brain's built and it starts building even before we're born, but then it goes through lots of different stages of building throughout our childhood and our young adulthood too. Um, when we think about this, we can imagine that it's a bit like Lego blocks connecting up together. And when we try and do something new and we try and learn a new skill, sometimes it can take us a while. And in my mind, I imagine that as being like these Lego blocks being quite far away from each other. And each time I try and do something that I don't know how to do, I think about the blocks getting a little bit closer together and a little bit closer together until eventually they click in and then they've worked together to be able to help us do something that we want to be able to do or learn something new. So this is what our brain looks like a little bit. Um, and in fact, if I come out of this for a second, I can show you that on my desk today, this is a, this is a little version of what's inside our head. I've also got my favorite brain pen on standby. It's got a little squidgy brain on it, which I like to play with sometimes. Um, so this is a tiny version of actually what's tucked inside our skull. Um, and 
we know that this part of our body, I'm just going to go back now to sharing my, um, where are we? There we go, uh, to sharing my slides. We know that this part of our body, our brain, pretty much controls everything that happens in our body. And um, sometimes we, we probably forget that, that this part of our body is controlling um, our breathing, it's controlling what we can see, it's controlling whether we feel hungry or not, um, it's signalling all sorts of things that are moving through our body to tell us what's going on, how we're feeling, what we're thinking, um, if we've hurt ourselves. Um, our brain, parts of our brain will light up to say, oh, that hurt if you touch something hot. So your brain's controlling pretty much everything that you do. So what I want to do to begin with then is to ask you a quick quiz question. And you, hopefully, or someone, maybe if you've got a parent or a carer there with you, they can show you how to do this. Or maybe you've got so great at using Teams now, you know how to do this. Um, but we're going to use the chat box for you to answer this question. It's a true or false question. So some people say that we only use 10% of our brain. Do you think this is true or false? And there might be a tiny bit of a delay because the lovely Maddie is doing our chat for us. Okay, I'm going to wait and see whether these answers come in in a minute. I'm going to carry on and we will see. I will give you a couple more seconds to answer that question. That leaves 90% Hazel, doesn't it, for us to be even more brilliant? <laughs> well, the thing is that actually lots of people say that we only use 10% of our brain when in fact most of the time we're using nearly all of it. Um, and so we don't really know where this myth came from that we only use a little bit of it um, because we have these amazing machines now that can help us to um, understand what's happening in our brain. They can help us to see which parts of the brain are sending signals to other parts of the brain. Um, and that can help us to understand that actually a lot of the time we're using nearly all of it. Okay. So if we think then that our brain is a bit like this great big box of Lego and when we're learning new things, we're kind of building new parts of our brain, then what it also tells us is that sometimes when we learn things, it can be quite hard work. And you might have found this too. Perhaps you've been trying to learn something at school that's taking a little bit of time to really master or understand, or perhaps there's a skill or a hobby that you've been trying at home that you're finding a bit tricky sometimes. And the really important thing to remember about your brain is it has this really cool skill. We call it neuroplasticity. Um, so you can try saying that word if you want to. I'll say it one more time, neuroplasticity. What that means is that our brains are really adaptable, a bit like Lego. We can take bits off or we can build new bits. And we have this great skill that means we can learn new things. But it also means that sometimes it can be quite hard work to learn something new. And especially if it's the first or second or third time that we're trying it. Um, and sometimes we might feel like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do this. It's too hard. But actually... It's just our brain working really hard to help us to learn something new. And that's why probably your teachers and maybe your parents tell you to keep going and to not give up when things are a bit tricky sometimes. Because actually, when we can get past a tricky bit, then we probably help our brain to put another Lego block together to connect some bits up. And that can be really helpful for us. OK, so. How I want you to think now for a minute, and this is um, Honey's brilliant thinking character that she's done for me. You can see, see this little figure down here. What has your brain helped you to do this year that you couldn't do last year? And you can put that in the chat box for us to share with us if you want to, or maybe you can have a chat um, and share these ideas with whoever else you're um, watching this with tonight. Um, so just think about it. Think, what couldn't you do last year that you've been able to do this year? Maybe you couldn't skip 
and you've learned how to do that. Maybe you couldn't tie your shoelaces and you've learned how to do that. Perhaps you've learned something in maths or English that was really cool that you didn't know and that you now know. Maybe you've been able to learn how to make a new recipe or perhaps you've tried origami like Honey loves to do and learn how to do something new with that. Whatever it is, I just want you to think about it for a second and think, what have I learned that I didn't know how to do last year? And then we can think about how our brains have actually helped that to happen. We should feel really grateful to them for being able to keep making these new connections, to keep learning new things so that we can keep being able to do new things that perhaps we didn't know how to do before. And your brain will keep doing that, not just while you're a child, but throughout your whole life. So you might also want to ask your parent or carer what they couldn't do last year that they've been able to do this year, what their brain has helped them to learn. Um, because we know that we can keep learning things throughout our whole life and that we can keep changing how our brain works. OK, so now we're going to get into what we call the brain house. And really, this is just an idea that we use sometimes to think a little bit about what's going on inside our mind and to understand a bit more about our thoughts and our feelings. So we're going to imagine that the brain is like a house. Of course, it's not really. I've shown you a little character. I've shown you my little squishy brain. And really, it doesn't look anything like a house. Um, but for fun, and because it's a helpful way for us to think about how our brains work, we're going to imagine it is like a house. And we're going to imagine that we can put some characters inside our house. Now, of course, we don't really have little characters living inside our brains either. But this is a really helpful way for us to sometimes make sense of what might be happening inside us, why we might feel certain things or my, why we might behave in certain ways. And so we're just going to play around with this idea today to help us learn a bit more about our mind. So I'm going to show you a little clip that I made um, with the BBC. This is on BBC Teach if you want to watch it again. Um, and then we're going to go and get stuck into actually some doing with honey. Hello, I'm Dr Hazel. Welcome to the Brain Lab, where we can explore the power of our brains. Today, I want to talk about what our brains are doing when we experience different emotions. Sometimes our brains can become overwhelmed with emotion, such as sadness, anger, excitement or fear. Have you ever felt like that? I know I have. But what's happening inside our brains when we feel these strong emotions? Well, we can think of our brain as being like a house with an upstairs and a downstairs and people living on both floors. Should we take a closer look in the brain house and see what's going on? So here we are in the downstairs part of the brain house. The feeling people live down here they help to signal what emotions we're experiencing, and they also keep us safe by being on the lookout for danger. If you like, you can name these people. Mine are called Alerting Ally, Frightened Fliss, Fun-Loving Frida, and Big Boss Betty. Let's take a look upstairs. The upstairs floor of the brain house is the thinking floor. This is where the thinking people live. They help us to understand our emotions, to decide how to behave, and to solve problems. Here we've got calming Carla, taking some deep breaths on her yoga mat, and problem-solving Paula, helping us to understand our feelings. The brain house works in harmony when the people on both floors talk to one another and work together. We can help our brains to do this when we connect with other people, learn new things, help others, take notice of what's happening around us, and when we're active. But the downstairs floor sometimes takes over. This could be because it senses danger or gets overwhelmed with a feeling such as fear or excitement, and it makes it hard for us to think. This is called flipping the lid. You might notice some changes in your body when this happens. Perhaps your heart beats faster or you feel a bit hot. Although our brains are trying to keep us safe, it's not always very helpful when we flip our lids. That's because the thinking people on the upstairs floor and the feeling people on the downstairs 
can't talk to each other and everything in the brain house feels a bit chaotic. Everyone flips their lids sometimes. Can you think of a time when you flipped yours? So our thinking and feeling flaws can work together again. Here are some things we can try to help get our lids back on. Focus on taking five deep breaths. Move your body. Try doing some star jumps or jogging on the spot. Find a grown-up you trust to talk to. Have you tried these? Of course, we don't really have people living inside our brains, but imagining that we do can be a fun and helpful way to make sense of what's happening in our brains. Remember, everyone flips their lids sometimes. The trick is to find out what helps you to put it back on. Okay, so we're going to now start to play with our own ideas about brain houses. And we're going to imagine, just like we watched in that little cartoon, that our brain is like a house with an upstairs and a downstairs. And in the downstairs part of our brains, we have what I call the feelers. Um, so these are the characters that are related to our emotions. And when we start to make our own house, we can really start to play around with the sorts of emotions we might imagine live downstairs. And here are some of Honey's brilliant um, cartoon characters that she's done for us that represent some of the different feelings that we might experience. Uh, if you've got some ideas about different feelings that you um, can name, um, then put them in the chat box for us so that we can start to get a sense of the different types of point or another. When I look at this picture of Honey's, what I see is some characters that are maybe feeling really excited, um, some that are perhaps feeling a little bit sad. And it's really important for us to remember that we need all of our feelings. They all have a place. They're really important ways for to signal to our brain. Um, they're like sources of information and they send messages to our brain to let us know what's going on. When we're sad, we cry. And often that's a really good signal to let other people also know that perhaps we're not feeling so good and they can come and they can perhaps help us um, with our feelings. Um, so, and we've got other characters on here too. I can see one that looks a little bit angry. I don't know if you can spot that one too. Um, so we have all of these different types of feelings and they can all really help us to understand and make sense of what's going on in the world, what's going on with us. And then we have the upstairs part of our brain and this is where we have the thinkers. And these are the characters that I imagine are the ones that really help to listen to the feelers and then try and decide why we might be feeling sad or excited or um, angry or any other feelings that we might be experiencing. And so I call it dream work is teamwork. You might have heard that expression from school. And really what that means to me is that when the downstairs parts of our brain, the upstairs part work together and they send little messages up and down to each other, that's when our brain's really working at its best, when it's making sense of what we feel and it's listening to the feeling characters and then the thinkers are maybe trying to decide what we should do and how we should behave. But everybody, flips their lid at some point and when we start to play around with this in our own origami house we can talk a bit more about what that feels like so I'm going to hand over to Honey now so she can start to tell us a bit about how we're going to make this amazing origami brain house. Fantastic that was amazing um, Dr Hazel thank you so can you all see my screen and what I've got on my mat? Yes I can. fantastic so origami is the art of paper folding and it's centuries old and although we think of it as Japanese it probably began in China which would make sense as that is where paper was actually started, making paper was actually started. So here I've got some sheets of origami paper which as you can see are square, they come in lots of different colours. Um, and you can get different sized ones. And here we've even got some traditional Japanese origami designs. But if you don't have origami paper, we can just use printer paper. And this is just um, white printer paper. 
um, that isn't a square. So I'm sure that perhaps you know already from school how to make it a square, but let's just refresh our memories. So if you can see my, I've got it landscape, which means that the piece of paper is on its side. And this bottom left hand corner, I'm going to pick up and I'm going to roll it very gently across to the other side. I'm not going to fold it or crease it down yet until I'm sure that these two edges line up. And then I'm going to place my hand very gently and then crease from the middle to the outside edge. Hopefully you've got yourself a pair of scissors. And so I'm going to trim this bit that we don't need. I'm going to keep it because we might need it a little bit later. So there we go. So I'll put that to one side. When I open it up, I've got this diagonal line. What I really want is to have a cross in the middle. So this time I'm going to take the bottom right hand corner and I'm going to roll and take it across. And again, I'm going to be looking very carefully if it's point to point, edge to edge and side to side. Place my hand down in the middle and then from the middle to the outside edges. I'm going to give it a really good crease. And sometimes with origami, you can use your nail to just run it along the edge so that that's a really nice sharp edge. And we're going to open it up. Now this time I want to make it into a rectangle. So I'm going to lift both the bottom edges and roll it up to the top, not squashing it down just yet, because so often when I've tried it before, I've squashed it down too early and then realized that the crease isn't as neat as I would like it. So I'm going to make sure the corners are matching the corners and the edges and the side to sides are just right. And then I'm going to press down gently with my hand and I'm going to move my crease from the middle to the outside edge. Now to make our origami house, we want to make sure that the folded bit is at the top. So just have a look at your piece of paper and just check that you can lift up, almost like pop your finger in at the bottom like that, okay? Next thing is we're going to fold it across like you would a page in a book. So we're going to take it across. Again, don't crease it down just yet. Make sure that the corners match make sure that it's side to side and edges to edges and then we can fold that crease down using our nail as well and it's worth doing it a couple of times and then we can just open it up like the pages of a book now this time often with origami you find that you're doing mirror images of things so what you might do to one side you might have to fold and do exactly the same on the other side all it is is it's just the mirror image so we're going to very carefully pick up this corner at the top and somewhere roughly in the middle we're just going to put our little finger there and help it along and we're going to look at that center crease now you may not be able to see the center crease because my light's shining quite brightly but hopefully you will be able to see the very middle and bring that corner to the middle and then make a nice firm crease like that. Okay, and then when you open it up, you've got your crease down there. So what we've done to one side, we now want to do to the other side. So we're going to bring this corner over. We might just help it with that finger a little bit, bring it over, and we just want to make sure that they line up as neatly as possible before we squash it all down, just so that we're sure. There we go. So now we're going to open up and we should have a middle crease and then two creases either side. So on this first crease, we're going to concentrate on giving our roof a shape. So we're going to bring this corner in just to make a slanted shape to the top of our roof of our brain house. And we're going to bring this top left hand corner into that first crease. Now, if you're really interested in maths, you'll see that there's a nice little right angle there. And I know that that pleases a lot of people. So we're going to do the same on the other side as well. We're going to bring this corner in and we're going to line it up so that we get that nice right angle. And then we can just 
crease that down. Okay, so once we've got those flaps, we now need to see it does, it looks a little bit like a house, but not quite the same as this house, which is what we're actually trying to make. And as you can see, we've got sort of two sides to this house. So we're going to open up the first flap that we made and we're going to tuck our finger into the corner and we're kind of inside going to slide our finger across. And do you see it kind of moves it open? And with our other finger, we're going to just give it a little tap, a little gentle tap and press down to open that bit up. So I might just do that again so that you can see. So we're going to bring that corner in. So we've got a really nice crease. We're going to tuck our finger in between the layers of the paper, open out that fold. And then with our other finger, give it a little tap down. And that's the left hand side of our house. So what we've done to one side, we now are going to do to this side. So we're going to tuck our finger in between and we're going to move it across and with our other finger, give it a little tap so that we can crease it down. So that looks much more like the brain house that we want to have. We can open it up. And this is where in actual fact you're going to need maybe a little tissue or perhaps um, a scrap of toilet paper, just something perhaps soft that you can put in. It could even be a couple of other pages um, in your notebook. And we're going to need a sharp pencil. And we're going to pop the tissue that I've got here. We're just going to pop it underneath. OK, I'm going to just close those for a moment. Because what I want to do is I want to draw a couple of lines just to mark out the bottom of this triangle here. So hopefully you can see that. Actually, if I do it in a dark pen, you'll be able to see it nicely. That's one side. And that's the other side. So when I open it up, can you see those lines there? Great. And I've put my tissue underneath so that I can get a sharp pencil and I'm going to just make a few little pricks. Now, some of you might know the word perforation. Now, perforation is just literally making a few little pricks. And I'm just going to do four little pricks in that corner here and four little pricks in this corner on the other side. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I actually want to think about more about Dr. Hazel's flipping the lid. And I want a part of my brain house that can actually pop up. So I'm going to get my scissors and I'm just going to very, very carefully just see if I can get my scissors into one or two of those little pricks. And that will sort of like give me an opening to get my scissors in so that I can cut along the line that I've made. So again, on this side, see if we can get our scissors in. Just be very careful and slow because there's no hurry. And there we go. And now, look at that. I've got a little bit that flips up. Fantastic. So do you remember earlier I said we might need this extra bit of paper? What we're going to do is we're going to slide it underneath because we can't have a brain house if we can't really see what the brain might look like. And so we're going to I'm going to show you how to make these kind of like curvy marks to suggest that of what our what the brain might look like and how we might draw it. So I'm going to get my pen here. And I tend to think about drawing a couple of U shapes or W shapes and then some N shapes, those sort of rainbow shapes that you can have. And they might go over the top. I might be able to come off the edge and then have a rainbow shape over the top there. And maybe I'll have a U shape here and I can draw some extra lines 
to suggest what the brain looks like because the brain is a really fascinating organ and we know that it's kind of pink and it's wrinkly and some people even say it's a bit like a soft mushroom so we're going to color it pink and it doesn't matter if we go over the edges at all and you I know will be able to do the most beautiful coloring and you can take your time. You might decide to use colouring pencils, fine liners. And I quite like tucking pieces of paper underneath because it takes away the worry that I might go through to the other side or I might miss bits. And I really want to make my brain house as beautiful as possible. So when I take that piece of paper away, I now have a beautiful little part of my brain that can flip its lid. So over to you, Dr. Hazel, because here I've got my brain house. I can even make my brain house stand up if I wanted to. So we can do that maybe at the end. But I think it's missing some people inside. It it's certainly, certainly is. is. Well, well done. done. Well, managed to keep, keep up, up with, with um, um, honey. honey. Honey, I might just need you to mute your mic for a sec. Um, I'm hearing myself back for a minute. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what we're going to need to do now, then, as Honey was saying, is we're going to need to put some characters into this house that you've been creating. And um, Honey's thought of some really exciting ways for us to do this. We are going to get a little bit messy, um, but that's okay. You can wash your hands afterwards. Um, so what we're going to do to begin with then is to start to think about the characters who live downstairs. And these are the feeling characters. And I've had some people been messaging in the chat box to tell me some different feelings that we might feel, sadness, excitement, feeling happy, feeling angry. So what you're going to do is to get one of your felt tip pens or your markers and um, don't use a permanent marker because then I'll be really unpopular with your parents or your carers. Um, use ones that you can wash off afterwards um, and draw on your finger so that you can get that lovely um, shape that Honey's getting that can start to create these characters for us. And what Honey's also doing is drawing some stairs into her brain house. And you can do this too if you want to, or you can draw some ladders. You can draw anything. You could have like a special rope ladder that goes from downstairs to upstairs. You can be as creative as you want with your brain house. Um, so what you can do then is to start to think about having some way for your downstairs characters, the feeling characters, to be able to communicate and talk to the ones that we're going to put upstairs. So have a go, draw on your fingers. Put some stamps on. And then you might decide, OK, so we know that these are different feeling characters, whoever you've decided to put in the downstairs of your brain, you might want to start giving them some expressions. Um, so perhaps you're going to have some characters that live downstairs that could be a bit like the one that I have. Here's Honey's drawing one with a big megaphone, I think. And that's maybe one way that, that the downstairs might communicate with the upstairs characters. Um, but you might decide that your character has some other special way of talking to the upstairs characters. Um, so we can put one who perhaps seems like they're a little bit in charge. We could have one that's feeling a little bit sad. And that was one of the feelings that someone told us um, they might feel sometimes. And remember, all of these feelings are really important for us. We need all of these different feelings because um, they help us to know how to behave. They help us with our feelings and our thoughts. Um, they're really, really important sources of information to us 
even if they don't always feel that great sometimes we probably would prefer to just feel really happy or excited all the time but actually we need all of our feelings they're all really important for us and they are definitely great sources of information when we start to listen to these different characters and what it is that they want to tell us so we can put different feeling characters in the downstairs part of the of the brain house that you're creating. And um, as we're talking, you might be thinking about the different characters that you want to put in there. You don't have to rush this, of course. It's going to be available to watch back. So you might just want to be enjoying watching Honey creating her characters for now. And then you could decide about which characters you're going to put in later on if you want to. Um, but just have a think, even if you don't put them in yet, just have a think about different feelings that you might experience. Maybe you've already had a few different types of feelings whilst you've been watching this video. Um, maybe you're noticing how you're feeling right now. Perhaps you're feeling hungry. Maybe you're feeling um, creative and excited about doing something new. Uh, maybe you're feeling, um, you know, a little bit worn out because you've had a full day learning at school or learning from home. So whatever you're feeling, you might want to think about which characters are going to go in the brain house in the downstairs. Those are the feelers. And then what we're going to do is to start to think about putting some characters in the upstairs too. And these are the ones that we call the thinkers. And so the thinkers have a slightly different role to our feelings. The thinkers are the ones who help us to make sense of what it is that's going on and maybe help us to decide how we want to behave. Um, so maybe even if we're feeling really, really angry about something and um, the thinking part of our brain might be the one that says um, probably best not to throw something at your teacher, even if you're feeling really angry. Um, so the thinking characters might be the ones that are helping us to behave in the ways that we want to behave. So you might decide, in my brain, I have one that's definitely for calming down upstairs, a thinking character that helps me to calm down. You might decide that you have one of those too. Um, mine doesn't always work, um, but sometimes it does. You might notice that perhaps you also have characters that can be quite creative in their thinking upstairs. Maybe they come up with really cool new ideas um, or they, you know, here we can see in Honey's um, brain house, she's drawing a really cool artist as part of her creative characters. Um, so you might have one that does a bit of problem solving. Perhaps sometimes what you really need in the thinking part of your brain, one of the characters that you really need is someone that can go, whoa, hang on a minute. Let's think all this through. Let's decide what the next best thing is to do. Let's try and understand how we can move forward or how we can make sense of this. And we might call this a problem solving character. Honey's got one here. I think it looks like it's doing lots with technology, this problem solving character. Perhaps it's trying to figure out how to use Microsoft Teams or something like that. So whatever thinking characters you might need, and children put all kinds of thinking characters in their brain houses, there is no right answer for this. It's just maybe the sorts of things that you notice that you think might be fun to have in your brain house. Um, some people put superheroes upstairs to help them to be absolutely brilliant at the things they want to try and work towards or the things they want to learn. Um, some people put um, characters that remind them of being kind um, or behaving in ways that are helpful towards other people. You could put whatever you want in that brain house. But the really important thing that, that we haven't talked much about is about how our brains can flip their lids sometimes. And we've got this little flap on your origami house. Um, what happens sometimes, and we all flip our lids, by the way, your teachers do, your parents or your carers do, maybe your grandparents do. Um, maybe if you've got brothers or sisters, you might have seen a time when they flip their lid too. And when I say flip my flipped your lid, what I mean is when we get so overwhelmed with a feeling that we can't think at all. 
and just we can't even make sense of what it is we're feeling and maybe we get like really really raging and angry maybe we just feel so sad we just want to throw ourselves on the floor maybe we're so excited we can't even hear anything that anyone else is saying perhaps it's going to be a special day coming up for you and you're getting so excited about it that you can't even think and when that happens, when our brain flips the lid, what it does is it stops us to be able to communicate with these upstairs characters. We can't climb up the rope ladder or run up the stairs or make sense of our feelings. And although that's OK and that happens to all of us, what we want to learn a little bit is how we can help sometimes the thinking characters to get back together with the feeling characters again and be able to talk because otherwise it can look a bit like um every all the thinking characters like they fall over and they get like whoa they can't even stand up because they're losing their balance because our brain has just flipped and, and we can't even communicate we can't connect with them and we know like i said with dream work being teamwork um that actually and teamwork being dream work did i say that the wrong way around maybe my brain did a little flip just then um, we know that it's best if our thinking and our feeling works together to help us to make sense of what's going on for us. So you might be thinking now about a time when you flipped your lid or you might be remembering a time when maybe your teacher or your parent flipped their lid. Um, and it's really normal for us all. It's a really clever trick of our brain, actually, to keep us safe and protect us from danger, because sometimes thinking can be quite slow. And so sometimes the, just the feeling characters want to be in charge because they think that they're better at keeping us safe. And maybe they are, but not always. So what we're going to do now then, I hope you're having fun putting some different characters into your house. As you can see with what Honey's doing here, she's creating some of the thinkers that I think have like spilt their paint or exploding a little bit or falling over, um, perhaps just really feeling a bit like they've flipped their lids. Um, and that's OK. Remember, we all flip our lid, but we're going to talk for a couple of minutes about some things that we might be able to do to get our lids back on again. And then we're going to read a story because you've all been working really hard and you might want to carry on with your brain houses while we're reading the story. So there's a few things that we can think about doing that will help us when we maybe have noticed that we flipped our lids. And one of them that's really, really easy to talk about now, but actually really hard to do in practice is to breathe and to take some big, deep breaths. And Honey today had an idea about how we can build this into our brain house, this idea of breathing. Now, I behind me, I've got one of these balls. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these but you can expand them. You might have one in your house too. You can expand them and you can make them smaller again. And I think about sometimes when I need to take some deep breaths, I think about breathing in and filling up my belly with air and then breathing out and letting it all go again. And sometimes when we breathe in this way, we send a really clever message to our brains, particularly to the downstairs part of our brain to say, hey, it's okay. We're going to get the lid back on. We're going to get the thinkers back working again. But first of all, we've got to take some deep breaths to get that to happen. So Honey is drawing on her brain house now, this idea that we can breathe in perhaps as we go up a mountain and breathe out as we come down. And you can trace that maybe on your paper with your finger as a way to think about breathing in and breathing out. It's a really good thing to practice when we're not flipping our lids so that we can do it when we are. It's one of those things that takes a little bit of practice. But when we've been able to practice it, it can really help us to get our lid back on. So that's one thing we can do. Another thing that's really good for us to do when we think we're going to flip our lids or when we have flipped our lids is actually to move our body, just like we said in the little video we watched at the start. Sometimes it's just really great to run around, run on the spot, do some star jumps, do some crazy dancing, run around like your wiggly jelly, whatever it is that you can do to just get your body moving. Actually, that can be a really helpful way to signal to the downstairs characters in your house that there's no need to panic, that actually we're OK. We're just going to move our bodies for a minute and help the thinking characters to wake up a bit. So one way then is to 
to move your body in any way that feels good to you. You might want to have a little kitchen disco, put some music on, have a little boogie. And that can help us also to get back in contact with the thinkers and the feelers together again. And the last thing I want to share about what helps us to get our lid back on is actually um, talking to a grown up or someone that you trust and telling them a bit about what's going on with your thoughts and your feelings. Um, it's a really helpful skill for us to learn how to talk about our feelings and our thoughts. Um, but it's not always something that we practice very often. But when we can practice it, when we can talk about them with, with other people that we trust, it can also really help us to make sense of what's going on in the brain house. And you might also notice that there are certain characters in the brain house when you start to talk about it, maybe with a grown up, someone that you trust, they might help you to see that perhaps one of the characters in the brain house has got a bit bossy, which happens sometimes, and that we need to dial up the strength of some of the other characters to help out a bit. And so we can do that. We can think about when we start to talk about our feelings, we can start to think about how who we need to help us to manage maybe some of the big feelings that we're having. As you can see, as Honey's still sketching, she's drawing another brilliant one. I think maybe an angry one and maybe a bossy one. <laughs> um, she's also showing you how you can turn it into a house. So I'm going to let Honey talk a little bit for a minute and, and update us on where she's got to, and then we're gonna read the story. Okay, fantastic. So I hope you've enjoyed some of the characters. I love uh, Big Boss Booty and I love sounding the alarm and then all of our thinkers upstairs. And definitely I know that I've had those moments where those characters have been sort of like, you know, sort of um, trying to uh, fight with one, any, one another almost. So we've got our lovely breathing mountain here. So this is something that you can really keep and, um, you know, practice some of those relaxation um, ideas or go out or paint or um, take up yoga even. So that's as you open up the house. And of course, when you turn it over, you've got some space on the back. The front of the house you could design Maybe it might look a little bit like the front of your house or as I've done here, I've kind of like suggested that this is my brain and I've actually drawn the character from the story that we're going to listen to a little bit later. But you might decide that on the back we can think about some of those ideas and I'm going to draw some speech bubbles and there are all sorts of different shapes of speech bubbles. And um, I'm just going to practice drawing some of them in pencil. And I think that's OK to be able to. Draw some of them in pencil first to give you the confidence. To then go over them in coloured pen, whatever way you want. So here we've got lots of different shaped speech bubbles, even a little thinking bubble here coming into our brain. And then I can choose different colours once I've got those lines. And I think often that's the same with a lot of things that we sometimes have to keep practising. It doesn't matter if we make a mistake. And by practising, we just simply get better at what we're doing. So with the origami house, if you're new to making origami, then just keep having a go because I definitely have had to practice quite a lot of things as an artist. And that can be really frustrating because I want to be so good at it, but I've just kept on trying and I've kept on being with friends and people who have encouraged me. And that gives you the confidence to sort of do your breathing, reset, think about your friends and what you're good at and what you can do. And all the time you're improving and being successful and creating your own happiness. So there we go. We've got lots of different kind of thought bubbles. And what might we put in them? So what we were thinking is that on the back of your brain house, what you could put is some of the ideas that you've got for what you can do, maybe when you're flipping your lid or what you've found helps you to feel good. 
um, so that you've got it as a reminder there. So there might be immediately things that you can think of. I know that having a good dance in the kitchen always helps me to feel good again. So sometimes I just have to go and do that um, and have a little boogie. Um, but you might have other things that you know really help you. Perhaps if you feel like you're going to flip your lid, um, someone's put in playing football. Brilliant. Thank you. That's a great idea. So running around playing football, um, you know, that can be a great way to, to take care of our what we call well-being, to take care of ourselves. Um, Honey's got a few different ideas of characters that are going here. But if you want some more inspiration, you can check it out and think about who you might want to put in your brain house. Um, but yeah, this is just for you to keep. So you can put your ideas on the back there if you want to. You could put some helpful thoughts. You could put things like Honey was just saying, things like keep working hard. You can do it. Um, or you can put um, perhaps other people that you know are your support, um, your good friends or your family that you can turn to. Whatever you feel is going to be helpful to put on the back there. So I am going to start to read a story now because we are almost coming to the end of our stem session. Wow, that's gone so quickly. Um, and I'm so thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. So we're going to read a story now about a particular brain house character, um, perhaps one that we've all been feeling a little bit recently. Um, and it's really about that feeling of worry. And what happens when we feel a bit worried? And we're going to read this beautiful book. And I'm going to get my copy now, which is sitting behind me. I'm also lucky enough to have a little plushie that goes with my book. Um, so this book is by um, a friend of mine called Karen Young, who's a, a cl clinical psychologist who works over in Australia. And we're going to read it together so we can learn a bit more about our feelings. So there's a feeling called anxiety. Some people say it feels like missing a stair or that feeling of falling when you're almost asleep. Anxiety can happen to anyone. Teachers, doctors, rock stars, parents, gardeners, dancers, astronauts, weightlifters, lion tamers, lots of different people. There's a good chance that plenty of kids you know also have it. Maybe they're going through it right now. Anxiety happens because a part of your brain, an awesome part, thinks there's something it needs to protect you from. It's called the amygdala. It's not very big and it's shaped like an almond. Your amygdala switches on when it thinks there might be danger. It's kind of like your own fierce warrior, always there to protect you. If it senses trouble, it fuels your body so you can be strong and fast and powerful. Kind of like a superhero. Why don't you give your amygdala a name? Anything you choose will be perfect. Sometimes there can be a teeny tiny problem. The amygdala doesn't always check anything out. It's a doer, not a thinker. All action and not a lot of thought. So sometimes it thinks there's danger when really there's no danger at all. If there is really something dangerous, like a grumpy tiger on the loose, then your amygdala is brilliant. Instantly, it will power you up with speed and strength so that you can get out the way. Your amygdala is always working hard to protect you, even when you don't need protecting. Have you ever burnt the toast and set off the fire alarm? I do this all the time in my house, by the way. Um, the alarm can't tell the difference between smoke from a fire and smoke from burnt toast, and it doesn't care. All it wants to do is keep you safe. Your amygdala works in the same way. It can't always tell the difference between something that might hurt you and something that won't. So what happens inside your body? Well, when your amygdala thinks there might be something that could hurt you, it powers up your body with special body fuel, including oxygen and hormones and adrenaline. And this is to make you strong and fast and powerful in case you need to run for it 
or fight for your life. This causes some pretty amazing things to happen inside you, but it doesn't always feel that amazing. If there's no need to run or fight, there is nothing to use up all the fuel surging through you and it just keeps building up. And this is why you feel the way you do when you have anxiety. It's your body doing what strong, healthy bodies do, but just a bit more than usual. When you feel anxious, your brain tells your body to stop using up oxygen on strong, deep breaths so that your muscles can use it to run or fight. This makes your breathing fast and shallow. And when this happens, you might feel puffed or breathless. Your cheeks might blush red. Your face might feel warm. The oxygen builds up inside you and the carbon dioxide you normally have drops. This can make you feel dizzy or confused and your heart beats faster to get the fuel to where it's needed in your body. Your heart might feel like it's pounding too hard or beating too fast. Don't worry, this is completely safe. Your heart knows exactly what it's doing. The fuel gets sent to your legs in case they need to run and to your arms in case they need to fight. Your arms and legs might feel tight or wobbly. Your amygdala also looks after your emotions. When you feel anxious, it means it's very active and it's working hard. You might burst into tears or get angry. Your body cools itself down so it doesn't overheat if it has to run or fight. And that's why you sometimes might feel a bit sweaty. And your digestive system, that's the part of your body around your stomach that gets nutrients from food that you eat. It shuts down so the fuel it was using can be used by your muscles for running or fighting. You might feel as though you have butterflies in your tummy. That's a really unusual sensation, isn't it? But I know what she means when she talks about butterflies in your tummy. Maybe you do too. You might feel a bit sick, as though you're about to vomit, and your mouth might feel dry. So as you can see, there are very real reasons your body feels the way it does when you have anxiety. It's all because of your amygdala, that fierce warrior part of your brain that's trying to protect you even when you don't really need protecting. Your amygdala does a great job, but sometimes it works too hard. It takes over and it starts to decide how things should be done, even though you're really the boss. And that's why in my brain house, I have a character that's a bit bossy, but sometimes I have to boss that one back. Remember, it does this to protect you, but things will always run smoother when you're in charge. So how do we tell our amygdalas to, rela to relax? The most powerful way to make yourself the boss of your brain again is to let the fierce warrior know that you're okay. And you can do this by thinking powerful thoughts like this one. I can do this, or hey warrior, or whatever cool name you've given it. We're okay, you can relax now. Or thanks for looking out for me, but we're all good here. It will always be ready to listen to you. Another way to be the boss of your brain is to breathe strong, deep breaths. Part of the reason you feel the way you do is because fast, shallow breathing has changed the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your body. Strong, slow breathing changes it back again. When your breathing is relaxed, your warrior will also relax. Phew, it will think. Glad you're okay, dude. Then really quickly after that, you will start to feel better. So you can try this. For strong breaths, breathe deeply and slowly. Hold your breath for a second between breathing in and breathing out. Make sure the air is going right down into your belly, not just into your chest. You'll know this because your belly will be moving up and down. You can do this a few times. If you work on your strong breathing every day when you're calm, it will be easier to do when you need it. One way to know that your breathing is strong is by putting a soft toy on your belly when you lie down. If the toy moves up and down as you breathe, your breathing is perfect. Use whatever you want, a book, a banana, a pile of jelly. Actually, no, jelly on your belly would be just gross. Your warrior has been protecting you for your entire life. 
it loves working hard for you so it can make so it can might take a little bit of extra work to get it to relax keep working on your strong breathing and your powerful thoughts and you will get there in no time you and your warrior will be buddies but you will be in control always remember anxiety is a sign that you're about to do something really brave anxiety and courage always exist together always so take your strong breaths your powerful thoughts and that brave warrior of yours and go and be amazing and that brings us to the end of our session today thank you so much for joining us we really hope that you will share some of your brain houses with us. If you'd like to do this and your parent or carer has um, access to social media like Twitter or Facebook, you can use this hashtag brain house, um, WSC, it stands for West Suffolk College, um, to share your ideas with us. And I'm just going to flick through. I've had children share uh, and grown up share their brain houses from all over the world. So I'm just going to flick through a few different ones. This is actually Honey's one. Honey had an idea of doing one with animals and you can check that out. Um, if you follow Honey, um, you can check that out on her Instagram or on her Twitter and she'll teach you how to do that one. Uh, some people do it with cardboard boxes together, um, making different ways of connecting the upstairs and the downstairs. Some people have done it by cutting out pictures from different magazines. Some people have done it with pens and pencils and just drawn what it feels like to have their brain house inside their head. Some people have made it out of wood like this person here. And some people have done a little hinging one so that you can practice flipping it open and closed. Some people have even made one with a stop motion video and Lego characters. So please do share where you've got to. We'd love to see the creations you've made tonight. Um, Grown-ups, if you want to learn a bit more about how to teach your kids about the brain and the ideas that we've been talking about, you can check out my blog post, um, which is on my website. Um, you can watch this again on the STEMtastic um, page of West Suffolk College. Um, and if you have any worries or concerns, um, do make sure that you talk to an adult that you trust or you can call the child line um, to talk through any of these different fe difficult feelings if you feel you need a bit of extra help. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we've really had a good time sharing some of these ideas with you and I can't wait to see your brain houses. So take care everyone, look after your brains and hopefully we'll be able to find out what you've been creating.